In the age after the fall of the Orokin, the grand clade families of the Ostrons were cast wide across the solar system, roaming and homeless in their great floating markets. In this time, two young people were in love. The woman, Erfriha, and the man, Mirza. Erfriha was from the Ying Bindun Yai clade, meaning Great Bond, a very old and wealthy compact of bonded families. Mirza, however, had no clade, his family having been shattered by the Grenier many years before. He was Sitos, meaning landless, cladeless, a body turned to dust, turned to moats, on a careless wind. Ephria belonged to families within families. Mirza was alone. But to Efrihar, Mirza was a poet who had eyes to see the beauty of things and ears to hear the softly whispered language of the universe. I know a place, he said, where I may be homeless no more. I have heard a voice and it leads me there. Come with me. But Elfriha's father was a man made foolish by his wealth and vociferously disapproved of their love. Mirsa was cast adrift from the floating market that was home to his one true love. Erfriha and Mirza ran away together, as lovers do, and were never heard from again. Rent by grief, her family thought her dead. Her father passed away, clutching her cameo, at peace, thinking he would see her soon, in some moonlit afterlife. Decades later, ships entering ancient Earth's orbit were hailed from the planet's poisoned surface by an old woman's voice, gentle and knowing. Traders would call for her, greet her, offer the latest news on their families and lives, but never did they learn anything of this woman, save that she had a husband and they were somehow happy living on the toxic skin of that hostile world. The old woman would always Always ask those travelers of news of the Ying Bindunya I played. <laughs> Ying Bindunya junkers came searching for a sign of their missing daughter. The frail voice of their long-lost child reached out to them, and there was much joy. You will find us, 
her message said, by the light of our love. Efriha bade them make their home around a magnificent Orokin ruin, promising them that it would be a source of prosperity for generations to come. The Yingbindunyai arrived in their vast floating market. There, by a ragged coastline, winked a point of light. Follow the brightness of the love between Mirsa and I, said the message, and be safe from all harm. The wrathful Grenier took umbrage at this and sought to block their passage. But upon approaching that ancient Orokin tower, found their transmission silence, their engines turned cold, and their weapons reduced to lumps of dead iron. She was a being of the day, her husband a spirit of the night. Erfriha was a woman of the land, Mirsa a man of the sea. Mirsa understood the crushing weight of time in which Er existed. In return, Er gifted pieces of its ancient self to Mirsa, old things shaped to near shapelessness by a thousand years beneath the waves. Mirsa was a man dedicated to finding the sacred in the forgotten, the neglected, and took wisdom from them. After many decades, Mirsar had a small collection of such gifts, such that they could be held in two cupped hands. But in them, he understood the lifespan of a world, and so he had struck an accord with the creatures of the sea. For her part, in her times alone, Elfriha came to know the birds and animals of the plains, and likewise struck an accord with them. Even the tortured Eidolons, creatures of this world and the next, left them in peace and made the lands around the tower safe for the Ostrons. At the center of this place was the tower, and within the tower was the Unum, the voice, the force, that had called Mirsa and Elfriha there so many years ago for this exact purpose. But the Unum is a being for another time, <laughs> and another story. The Ostrons named their village Carifomil, family and prosperity. Erfriha was overjoyed to see her clade again, but Mirsa would not enter Carifomil, for he had no family save Erfriha. Erfriha was drawn to her clade, and Mirsa felt no resentment. She would one day return to them. Mirsa had known it would be so. Mirsa took the things the sea had gifted him over his long life and took to his boat and sailed out across his midnight ocean. He returned those gifts to the deep and himself to them too. But this was no death into which Mirsa stepped. For a world is made of cycles upon cycles 
Mirza stepped into his midnight ocean, falling down into it. And the deeper he sank, the larger he became. This is how the oceans of Ur came to be the home of the thousand-year fish. Legendary, vast, reclusive, the rare sight of which changes men. One of the great ancient spirits of Ur. The spirits of the land felt Elfriha's sadness, mad with grief for the loss of their friend to the spirits of the sea. The accord broke down, the animals and Eidolons returning once more to wildness. And so the people of the clade, Yingbin Dunyai, rebuilt the great Oricon wall that had, in centuries gone by, ringed their gleaming tower, and never again ventured out at night. The villagers decided as one that their home would no longer be known as Carifamil, family and prosperity. From that day forward, it would be known as Cetus, landless, of no one clade, home to any who are blown as dust on the wind. Efriha lived there the rest of her days, and for the remainder of her nights, she held vigil atop the walls of Cetus, looking to the sea, and, some say, occasionally catching sight of a great fish, like an island in a midnight ocean, looking back at her with love. It is said that Mirza continued to watch over the deep, as he had always done, and Elfriha the land. Often she would stand by her husband's sea, speaking in the language only those bound at the soul can know. When the day came and Erfriha passed from the world, her family buried her on the land. A great fish watched from the sea and kept vigil over her for ten days and nights. When it sank beneath the waves, it was never seen again. Some say Mirsa, the thousand-year fish, waits to this day for their story to be retold, relived, that he and Erfrihar his great love may one day be reunited again. This is Onko, Cetus Archivist, with my translation of the tale of the wife of the earth and the husband of the sea.